Uh, I have been, I'm, I'm an elder in the Baltimore Washington Conference, and, and I have sat through many annual conferences, so I understand how it goes, that having the opportunity to listen to one more person while you're sitting may not be the most enthralling opportunity for you, um, but uh, I mean, hopefully this will be a useful time, and so thank you for choosing to come to this workshop. We're going to be talking today about what some of my students call the E-word. Uh, and that's evangelism. And I know it's a word that carries an awful lot of freight with it uh, when, when folks talk about it. And what I want to offer to you today is some of my insights. I've been teaching evangelism now for nine years at Garrett Evangelical. And uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, I have had an opportunity during that time to uh, begin to formulate some ideas about how do we approach evangelism in a way that makes it a little more palatable and, in fact, a little bit more authentic to who we are. So it doesn't feel like something that we're forced to do in the way that oftentimes it comes across. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. A lot of this is drawn from my book, Evangelism for Non-Evangelists. Uh, you'll see, for those of you who like to order stuff online, IVP, University Press, was good enough to provide some codes there, so you're welcome to, uh, to use those if you want. It's in the middle. Uh, if you want to order those, they also have them over at the Cokesbury stand, so you can check them out. And I'll be sitting at the Garrett table, so if you buy one and want me to sign it and add an extra two cents when you try to auction it off on eBay, um, I'm more than happy to do that for you. But a little bit about myself first. My name is Mark Teasdale. I am the uh, E. Stanley Jones Associate Professor of Evangelism at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. Uh, many of you probably know Garrett. It's probably the big Methodist seminary in the area, right up in Evanston. We've got a good, good group of people who, uh, who are current students as well as alumni here. So thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, what I do there is I teach the required evangelism course according to the discipline. But what I've found over the years in teaching that course is that people come in and they oftentimes are very uncomfortable with evangelism uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, the word itself has a lot of very negative connotations connected to it. Uh, and that's usually because they've experienced something that's been very negative in reference to evangelism. The way I start every single class that I teach is I have everybody turn and look at each other and I say, okay, tell someone the worst experience you've ever had being evangelized. And uh, I've never failed to have the entire classroom suddenly become a buzz with conversation. Uh, I've never had someone who said, I've, I've never had that happen to me. I've just always enjoyed being evangelized. It's been great. Um, never once has that taken place. Everyone's got a story, and so that's part of it, is that we've had these really negative experiences of feeling judged, of feeling uh, as if we're being condemned, as feeling as if somebody just wants to talk and get their own agenda across and don't really care about us. As a result of that, a good friend of mine, uh, Stephen Gunter, who teaches evangelism down at Duke University, said that most of us define evangelism as that action which we did not like having done unto us, which we feel obliged to do unto others. <laughs> and, and I think that that's, that's often our experience of it. Um, the second reason is that a lot of people feel that evangelism is a specialized activity. It's something that requires very specific techniques. It's something that requires very specific best practices. And unless you know what those are, you can't really do it. The reality is that's not the case. Yes, there are techniques. And if you go on YouTube or if you go on any kind of blog, you'll find tons of techniques, tons of best practices for evangelism that are out there. None of them are bad necessarily. It's just that's not what the heart of evangelism is. And what I want to do is to offer it in a way that hopefully is a little more accessible and makes more sense, something you'll be able to take with you and help lead your congregations in. So just to set expectations properly, what I'm not going to be doing in this uh, little workshop is talking about how do you go convince someone to become a follower of Jesus Christ. What I'm hoping to do is to help you lead your congregations so that they know how to be comfortable talking about Jesus Christ with others. So this is really about getting the congregations primed to be able to share their faith more effectively. 
And that's why we call it evangelism for non-evangelists. These are people who don't identify as evangelists, but they feel like they ought to be involved in some way. So two elephants that we have in the room that I find as we engage in evangelism, and these uh, are this first one for what individuals have, the struggles that they have in dealing with evangelism, they all come from my experiences of working with students. So when I deal with seminary students, I'm dealing with people who are still lay folks, right? They're not, not ordained yet. They're coming in. And I see them as, in many ways, a window to the larger laity. And these are very engaged laity, obviously. They're coming to seminary. And if these are the struggles that they're having, then in many ways it points to the kinds of struggles that we can expect uh, to see the rest of our laity having as well. So the first thing that I think I found is that there's a lack of self-awareness. They've had this negative experience of evangelism, and so they're not aware of any other way to look at evangelism. Because there was this negativity that's there, that hangs on them. It hangs on how they think about evangelism, and they can't really move beyond that very effectively. They also are very good at articulating what they're against, but not necessarily articulating what they find is good. This, I think, comes from the larger culture around us. Um, if you've ever noticed, if you uh, watch TV, uh, particularly the news, or if you listen to talk radio, you'll find a lot of people who are very comfortable telling you everything that's wrong in the world. Uh, a lot of people who will say, this is what's wrong, these are the people that are wrong, here are the ways that everything isn't the way it ought to be. But if you push them for a positive vision, something that's forward-looking, that says, here's the beautiful thing that we want to move into, suddenly they're not quite so effective. The same problem is something that we're facing in our churches. People have become very effective at saying, here's what we don't agree with, but they're not so good at saying, here's what's so good that we're excited about living into it, and they can't articulate that. The second big issue that I've found is that there's a lack of theological awareness. What I mean by that is that when they can claim something that's good, they often don't know why they believe what they believe. So they can say, I believe this thing, but I'm not sure why. I've picked it up along the way, but I'm not entirely certain why it is that I believe this. And we need to be able to ground people in a sense of why is it that they believe what it is that they claim to believe. Alongside of that is that many times people have their faith formed outside of official faith communities, the more formal faith communities. What I mean by that is that we have something in the seminary we call folk theology. Now, most of us have folk theology. It means that we cobble our theology together. We don't just sit down with, you know, John Wesley's journals and sermons and notes on the New Testament and the articles of religion and confessions of faith, right, and, and determine what our theology is by going alongside of Mr. Wesley and figuring that out. Rather, we pick up our theology along the way, little bits and pieces here and there. It might be a prayer that our grandmother prayed over us at one point. It might be a movie that we watched whether it was a Christian movie or not, right? The Matrix was all the rage at one point, you know, the red pill or the blue pill, you know, kind of thing. And so we all have these different things we take and we use to make sense of how we think about God. The problem is, is when there's not a formal, the a formal community of faith to help support us in doing this, we find ourselves in a place where we're not capable of, of pulling it together in a coherent way that's shaped along with other people. And so we become idiosyncratic in what we believe, and we don't really have a way of checking it over and against the, the greater tradition of the church, much less a living community of the church. I also find that there's a lack of contextual awareness. Oftentimes what I find is that my students will tend to assume common experiences. If I've experienced this, everybody must have experienced it, and so everybody must think the same way that I do <laughs> as a result because we've all had the same common experience, right? I'm sure that you've never experienced that in your local churches where somebody says, you know, some people are saying, right? Because some people obviously have the same experiences as me, and so whatever I'm thinking, right, must be what everybody else is thinking when they're talking to you. And so there's this lack of awareness of what's going on around them in the larger context, a larger sense of how varied and, and different the world is and the people are around them. And so they become incapable of really engaging effectively beyond just the small group of people who have the same experience that they do. Finally, a lack of spiritual awareness. That folks are not as creative in their practices as they could be. 
part of the Holy Spirit's work is to be creative. The entire world, all the different colors, all the different realities, all the different things that we see out when we look at nature is indicative of how creative the Holy Spirit is. And yet when we have people who look at evangelism, they basically say, well, I guess we're going to have to order, you know, several bags of sawdust, a tent, and, uh, and a bunch of uncomfortable pews for people to sit in, right? And that's going to be what evangelism is. There's an absolute lack of creativity. People stereotype down what evangelism ought to be, and it's just about those practices. It's a lack of, for my sense, spiritual maturity there because we don't recognize that we have a creative Holy Spirit that can lead us into creative practices. And along the same lines, we don't necessarily expect the Holy Spirit to engage in transformation. One of the things that I think we do in seminaries, frankly, in denominations oftentimes, uh, is to push the idea that evangelism is really a human activity. It's really about the practices we pick up, and it's are we capable of making things happen? The reality is, is that evangelism is the work of God. God is working in people's lives already. The Holy Spirit is already working to transform people. That, for those of you who remember your Wesleyan doctrine days, is provenient grace. It's the grace of God to come and transform people before they know who God is. We join God in that work as participants, as agents of God's grace, but we're not the ones that make the transformation. And so oftentimes there's a lack of awareness that the Spirit's already at work and we're joining that. We think it's all on us to go out and try to save people. And that's a scary proposition. It's something people back away from. So that's the elephant, I think, in the room. This is what we're up against. We're not up against we just don't know the best practices. We're up against this much deeper lack of awareness on multiple levels that individuals in the church have. As if that weren't enough. That's individually. When you get us together, we've got a whole new set of problems that generate, all right? This is the elephant in the room for congregations. And these actually came from a study from Heather Heinzman Lear. Um, Heather's a good friend of mine. She's the director of evangelism down at uh, Discipleship Ministries in Nashville. And Heather did a uh, a really significant study of congregations that scored very high on the vitality index, right? Some of you may have heard of a dashboard, um, and in the dashboard, you have to type stuff in every so often, and there are people that keep track of that. Well, down in Nashville, they actually aggregate all these numbers together, and they determine just how vital you are, so how, how alive your church is, right? That's not spooky at all. It doesn't sound like the deep state or anything. And... Um, what you end up with is a situation where you've got some churches that are considered highly vital because all their numbers are pointing in the right direction. And what Heather wanted to do is to see if there was a correlation between people who are congregations that are highly vital and congregations that actually carry out the mission of the United Methodist Church, which is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Do the two things correspond to each other? And the answer she found was largely no. You can have a highly vital congregation that's not making disciples. And here are the four big takeaways from the research that she did. And this is fairly new. This research was done in 2015. The majority of participants, so this is what she went out as she talked to several different of these highly vital congregations, both their pastors and their lay leaders. And this is what she got out of them. All around the country, by the way, and from all different places, some city, some rural, some suburban. So she had a good good mixture. The majority of participants were unable to articulate why Jesus is important in their lives and how offering Christ to another person would benefit their life. This includes the pastors, right? So you may have heard Adam Hamilton's famous uh, three questions, why Jesus, why the church, why your particular church? What she found is they could answer why your particular church really well, because these are vital congregations. They've got all kinds of stuff. You know, we got racquetball on Tuesdays, and we've got water polo on Thursdays, and, you know, we've got our own water park that all the kids can come to, and you never have to see your child from Sunday morning till Sunday night, right? I mean, all these things, these cool things that you can come and do, and they could sell that. But when you ask them why Jesus... They couldn't answer it, nor could they say why Jesus was important. What they were really good at was selling the institution, not talking about the Savior. The second thing is the majority of congregations did not create intentional space for people to practice sharing their faith or foster an environment of authenticity. Basically, this is they didn't talk about their faith with each other. 
Again, what they did is talk a lot about their church and how cool their church was with each other because everyone wants to be on a winning team, right? So there's this team called the Cubs that's just north of you a little bit, and they did really well this past year. Don't, don't look at this year's season, right? But they did really well this past year. Everybody was talking about it because everybody's excited to finally, after 108 years, be on a winning team, right? People get excited about that when your church is the winning team. But by the same token, they don't talk about their faith with each other. And so they don't know how to talk about it outside the church because they don't talk about it with each other in the church. They don't give each other the opportunity to share their testimonies and to be able to share why Jesus is important to them. Fourth, the majority of part, or third, the majority of participants could not differentiate good works done by the church from those by civic or non-Christian organizations. A lot of people were involved in both the church and the Lions Club or the Optimist Club or the Rotary, but they couldn't really tell the difference. You know, we do good stuff, and all of it's good stuff, and there's no real difference whether we do it as a member of the church or as a member of the Rotary. It's all about the same. Finally, the majority of participants indicated that their congregations were not known in their community and that mission opportunities were based on member preferences rather than on community needs. Right? Here's the lack of contextual awareness. The idea that we're really into doing whatever it might be. Nobody may want us to do it, but we're going to do it anyway. And if people don't know us, well, that's fine. <laughs> you know, because you, you may have heard the story, Jimmy Carter, the former president, member of his church, his church used to love packing baskets for Thanksgiving dinner. And so one year they decided they'd make a big deal of it, and they got all kinds of people to pack baskets, get them ready to take out, and they got the high-end stuff, like the really good turkeys, right? Not just the basic level turkeys. You know, the good turkeys, they got all the best stuff. They put it together, and they had all these beautiful baskets ready to go. And then somebody turned to someone else and said, okay, does anyone know any poor people? They didn't know where to give them because they hadn't gone out into the community to decide, is this actually something that's necessary? Many of our congregations get excited about missions that we feel good about, but may be absolutely irrelevant to where we're located, to the context in which we're set. So these are things that are coming out of our highly, highly vital congregations, showing that they're not able to make disciples well. Now, lest I fall into the situation of just bad-mouthing the denomination, which I know is in vogue these days, um, let's move into some little more positive things. How do we move in a better direction? But first of all, let's talk about the people that we're going to evangelize. This is the first bit of good news that I want to share with you. LifeWay Research did a huge study of unchurched people, and by that they meant people who had not attended a congregation uh, for six months outside of a special event like a wedding or a holiday. So Christmas and Easter don't count, right? Or Mother's Day, right? They're out. But if you went to a church function of any sort outside of those reasons, uh, you were not unchurched. If you didn't for at least six months, then you were considered unchurched. So they spoke to thousands of unchurched people, and here's what they found. Almost half of the people they spoke to, 47%, said that they would discuss religion freely if the topic came up. Another third said that they would listen. They might not respond, but they'd be open to listening in the conversation. Only 11% said that they would change the subject, right? And only 35% said that someone had ever tried to explain the gospel to them at all, even though the vast majority are open to it. What this study showed is that the reason evangelism isn't happening isn't because the folks out there, outside the church, are unwilling to talk to us about it. It's because we've been unwilling to talk to them about it. In other words, the folks out in the world are far more willing to receive evangelism than the folks inside the church are willing to evangelize. This is a huge finding. That was found, and this is just last year that this was done. So this isn't like way dated data. This is just last year. And one of the things this should do is shift our whole mindset. I know you have been filled with all kinds of stories about how hostile the world is to the Christian faith and how the culture is secularizing and all that sort of thing. And yet what we're finding is that individuals are very open to hearing people talk to them about their faith. 
and even engaging in that conversation. So whatever your thought is, whatever stereotype the folks in your church may have about are people willing to hear about Jesus, the answer is the data says yes, right? There's still those 11%, and yes, people will run across them, but you're looking at 89% that generally are willing to say, I'll give it a shot, right? And that's really important to hear. Our hang-up is not the folks out there we're talking to. Our hang-up is internal. So how do we begin to reclaim evangelism for our congregations in a way that we can go out and reach these people that are open to the conversation? I think the way we do it is by rethinking the way we approach evangelism. And one way to do that is to make certain that we don't stereotype it internally, that we don't put it in a box. One way to do that is to recognize that evangelism actually has multiple pieces to it. Most of us think of it as word, proclaiming, going out, sharing our faith with our words verbally, and explaining why we believe what we believe, apologetics. But there are two other pieces to it as well. Yes, we need to be able to talk about our faith. Absolutely, that's part of evangelism. But there's also deed. When we go out and act out our faith, when we go out and do acts of mercy, caring for the person who is in need right now, when we go out and engage in acts of justice, going and caring for the structural problems that we see that are hurting people, those are part of our evangelistic ministry because we're showing that we actually do love people. We're not just telling them it, but we're backing it up with our actions as well. People will see that we are authentic in our words when we go out and act on it. I know that's not brilliant. That's pretty obvious in a lot of ways, but that's the kind of credibility that we have the opportunity to demonstrate. Those two things together are great, but they're not enough. The third one is this, sign. There needs to be transformation by the Holy Spirit. We need to recognize we're not doing this by ourselves. It's not our words and our acts of love that we're doing that will convert people. It's the Holy Spirit transforming folks. It's the Holy Spirit drawing people into the grace of God that they might be living lives of holiness, the way that John Wesley called us to. Evangelism requires all three of these pieces, and unless we have all three, we don't have a fully formed evangelistic practice. My sense is that what we need to do is to work on evangelizing the people in our congregations to recognize all three so that then they're equipped to go out and share with others. That's our first and most important work to do today. And just to say, by the way, no one one uh, act or ministry in your church has to be able to do all three of these things. The idea is to have it as a whole strategy, right? A fully orb strategy. So you've, you're doing the proclamation in some places, as long as there's also actions that are backing it up and you've got a place where you're praying for people and you're working for the, seeking the Holy Spirit to come and to transform. It's that you have them all working together. In this sense, evangelism isn't so much just a specific activity or a specific committee. Um, in fact, evangelism committees, I'm kind of ambivalent about. Um, in some ways, I think evangelism committees is where we send evangelism to die. Um, you know, it's sort of like, we're going to give it to those weird people over there that we don't really know. We don't want them on the trustees. God help us if they're on the trustees, right? Because then they'll have legal power over the church. Um, we don't want them to be in finance because they don't really know how to count. And so what we're going to do is put them on the evangelism committee, stick them over there, and they can, you know, you know work out a trunk or treat or something. Um, that's not evangelism. Evangelism is when this evangelistic idea of how are we sharing the word in word, deed, and sign, or how are we sharing the gospel message in word, deed, and sign becomes an ethic, an ethos for everything we do so that we're proclaiming the word in worship. We're acting out the word and how we relate to people afterwards when they've been at worship and we're greeting them in a meaningful way. And we're also praying for the people who have come, who have written their names in our little tablets, once we've finished worship. So that there's this whole ethic. Every ministry we have ought to have a way of saying this is how we're engaging in evangelism by incorporating these pieces. So how do we define evangelism then? I would say that we define it as a bias for the good news. Now, I know the word bias doesn't go over well in the United States, um, presumably anywhere else, I don't know, but the reason I use it is partly to be provocative. It's to get people thinking a bit. Evangelism has ISM at the end of it, right? Most words that have ISM at the end 
are not happy words, right? Racism, sexism. They're not happy words because it's talking about a judgment that holds up one over another. Evangelism does acknowledge that there's judgment, but it doesn't allow for judgmentalism. It doesn't allow for one group to be held up over another. What evangelism does is say it's a bias for the good news. And the good news is that God has redeemed all people in the power of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. No person should ever be condemned or sent away from the redemptive presence of God. Evangelism fights back against any news that suggests that somebody is not worthy of receiving God's grace. Anybody that's told they're not welcomed by God is not doing evangelism, right? That's the problem. Evangelism is about letting everyone know that the grace of God is open to all. When Jesus said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he did it openly. Everyone was welcome to repent. Everyone was welcome to join the kingdom. So evangelism is a bias for the good news, meaning it's a bias to let all people know they have been welcomed by the grace of God to come and share God's glory. How do we take that notion and then begin to move through the process of creating practices that allow us to live it out? I know this is kind of tiny. I apologize. I'm not a good uh, uh, PowerPoint person the same way that Steve Jobs was with like the big pictures, you know, and uh, but then again, I would be wearing all black if I was Steve Jobs. So anyway, the uh, evangelism equation is, this is, what, this is what my book is about primarily. So I'll, I'm going to hit on it briefly, but just enough to tease it so you can be really excited about buying the book and then, you know, want to read about it all the way. But the way I would suggest that we move people into evangelism is through walking through this equation. And there are four parts to the equation. The first is our starting point. We add to that our theological reflection. We add to that our contextual awareness. And all of that together equates to creative practices of evangelism. And my suggestion is if we do these things, we overcome those elephants in the room that we were talking about before. And we also generate an authentic kind of evangelism that we actually are excited to share with other people. So let me walk through this with you briefly. First of all, the starting point. The starting point is essentially your motivating story. It's, it's the story of your life. And, and bear in mind, I'm saying story here. I'm not saying just a belief, right? Too often when we talk about evangelism, we talk about this particular belief or that particular belief. One of the problems by just looking at individual beliefs is this, that beliefs don't convey truth as well as stories do. It's very rare that Jesus just gave us a belief. Most of the time, what did he do? He told stories. And because he told stories, there is a vast amount of truth that he was able to convey in ways that were much more meaningful to people than if he had just laid out, you know, I mean, can you imagine Sermon on the Mount? Jesus gets up and he says, and so the provenient grace of God will begin to work in your heart and following that justification will occur and you'll receive assurance of faith. You know, that's not how he worked. Jesus got up and said, the kingdom of God is like a man who went out to fish, right? We need a story in our lives. Now, what's that story about? The questions underneath. What is so good that you remain a Christian? Tell your story about remaining a Christian. Some of us may remember when we became a Christian originally. That's a great story if you remember it. You can tell that as a testimony. Some of us, like me, um, I don't remember when I became a Christian per se. I remember being in first grade and Mr. and Mrs. Duttweiler wanted to pray with us, and so I prayed with them. And, and from then on, I, I was a Christian. But it wasn't this grand kind of conversion narrative. I don't know if, if any of you grew up in churches like this, where people used to get up and they'd tell their testimonies, and they'd be like, you know, I was gun running for the Nazis in the middle of the Iran-Contra affair, and I had a harem, and I also was like a mule for the uh, drug lords. And then I found Jesus, and now I'm like a member of the Board of Trustees, you know? And so I used to watch those things and think, like, I've got a terrible testimony. Like, I was in first grade, and I never had a chance to, like, you know, gun run for the Nazis. I never had a chance to do these things and, and like, find out how awesome Jesus was. I just, you know, prayed a prayer and, you know, yeah. Um, and I felt like there was nothing really exciting there to be able to offer. That's why I rephrase it this way. What is so good that you remain a Christian? None of us have to be Christian. 
None of us have to be Christian. I mean, I realize some of you out there are getting a salary drawn based on the fact that you are a professional Christian in your church, but I've known enough pastors to know you don't really have to be a Christian. You can just, you know, you know, one, you, you already got your elders order, so you're guaranteed an appointment. Um, but notwithstanding, okay, that was, that was harsh. All right, but uh, I was on DCOM for several years, so I, I get this. The point is, we don't have to be a Christian. We could wake up tomorrow morning and decide, you know what, I'm, I'm done with Jesus. And no one would care. We could walk out, yell it from our front lawn, I'm done with Jesus. And our neighbors are going to be like, it took you long enough, right? You know, I mean, it's just, no one's going to care. There's no reason you have to stay a Christian, and yet you do. All of us do. Every day we have to decide that we're going to stay publicly identified with Jesus Christ. Why do we do it? Why bother? Right? It comes with all kinds of provisos and things that we've got to do as well. So why organize our lives around him? There's a story there in your life. There's a story there as to why Jesus is so important you won't let him go. And what I think is that story has something to do with the good that you've experienced, that there's something so good about Jesus in your life you couldn't let go, that if you were to let go of that, your life would lose its meaning, that your sense of purpose, your sense of direction, your whole sense of what all this existence is about would shatter. What is that story? What is that experience you've had about Jesus that you can't let go of? What is the good that you can't let go? For me personally, it's knowing that there is life beyond death, knowing that death doesn't have the final word. It's a story of understanding that this mortal life that we're in doesn't define us. And because of that, knowing that there is something far greater that I'm living for than just trying to get through and survive in the daily slings and arrows that I deal with. What is that story for you? What's that good that you know about Jesus in your everyday life? That's your starting point. And when you're telling that story, how big is the story? Is it big enough to be able to encompass how people look at all of existence? Or is it just a little tiny story? For most of us, it's a huge story. It's a story that has to do with how the universe itself operates. Most of us have two stories we live with. One is our personal narrative, our personal story, and the other one is, I'll I'm lay one big prof professor word on you here, a meta narrative. It's a big story. The big story explains how the universe works. The little story is how we operate within that universe, right? The little story tells the what and the who and the when and the where of what goes on in our life, but the meta narrative, the big story, tells the why. Why are things happening the way they do? How do we make sense of it? When one more tornado tears through southern Illinois, one more set of farms get destroyed, what is the why that we can say? What's the because? How do we answer that question? We all have that story, and somehow that big story that gives us the answer to the question why is tied into how good Jesus is for us. That's what we need to start with. Too often when we do evangelism, we try to start with somebody else's answer to the question why, right? There's nothing wrong with using gospel tracts and things like that, but so often when we do it, we're borrowing someone else's words to be able to explain why Jesus is so good. Gain your own words. Learn to articulate why Jesus is so good in your life. And in doing that, you begin to have an authentic grounding. There's something that's really good enough that you want to share with others because it's good enough that you want to embrace it yourself. That's really the acid test. How will you know you're ready to share with other people your faith? It's when you've gotten to the place where you can talk about your faith that you're so excited about it, you want to have it. You would want someone else to come and tell you about this because it's just that good. And when you want to hear about it, you know you're ready to share it with someone else because you've hit the nerve of authenticity, of honesty about what's meaningful for you. I mean, a really simple example of this, right? When you see a movie that's really good or when you, you know, run across, even if you eat at a restaurant that you think is really good, you go out and tell people about it, right? Because it's something you've really found meaningful in your experience. You've enjoyed it. It's the same thing. How have you experienced Jesus to be so good? And when you've hit that nerve where you would want other people to share it with you, 
then you know you're ready to share it with other people out of an authentic thing, not just out of the requirement to go do it. Take that and add to it theological reflection. We can't just leave it at the point of experience, as important as it is, because if we do that, we become idiosyncratic. Most of us have an astonishingly, an astonishingly good uh, capacity to become heretics if we're left on our own. Um, and the way that we avoid moving into heresy, the way that we avoid just saying that my experience is what everybody else experiences, is by reflecting theologically on what we believe. And how do you do that? Um, for those of you who have been to seminary, right, you know how to do all this. It's not a problem. For those of you that haven't, let me break it down. All of theology answers three questions. You know, all these giant textbooks, right, that you see, all the things that have been written from Thomas Aquinas to Jürgen Moltmann to John Wesley, all of them are answering three questions. Who is God? What does God do? How do we respond to God? Those are the three big questions of theology. And so what we need to do is when we've got our story, our big starting point, motivating story about the goodness of, of God in our lives, we begin to reflect on that theologically. Who is the God that's in my story? What is this God doing? How does this God act in the universe? And how is this God asking me to respond? We reflect on it theologically, not just in our own heads, but in conversation with others. So what are your sources of revelation? Revelation is where you believe that God has reached out and said, let me tell you about myself. The Bible, at least, we believe, is a source of revelation. Some of you may have other places, dreams and visions, perhaps, or other things that you may believe, other ways that you believe God has spoken into the world to share about who God is. How does what you're saying connect in conversation with those things? Does it match up with what the Bible says or what other forms of revelation may be telling you? Make certain you're doing this in conversation with others. How does it relate to the Christian tradition, right? The church has been working out these questions for over 2,000 years. We have a vast sum of wisdom that we're living with. We don't have to work it all out on ourselves, but be in conversation with the rest of the church history as we're working it out. Consider what's being said. Our experiences are our experiences, but sometimes we need to have them given some direction and form and shape in conversation with others. And for that matter, be in conversation, as Wesley would put it, in holy conferencing with one another. Talk to the folks who are around you. One of the crazy things about evangelism is that it can actually build bridges. I know oftentimes evangelism is seen as the way that we judge each other, right? This is my way of getting it right and your way of getting it wrong, and I've got to bring you over to my side. But evangelism can actually be a means of building bridges. Because if you're serious about trying to work out what you believe, and I'm serious about working out what I believe, even if we're in different places on the theological spectrum, we can respect what each other is doing and we can learn from each other. We don't have to walk away agreeing, but we can walk away respecting. Once we've done that theological reflection so that we've got the words, the articulation in a way that's faithful to the Christian tradition and to the sources of revelation God has provided, finally we add contextual awareness. So far we've got something that's meaningful to us and meaningful to the church, but it's still got to be meaningful to the folks that we're going out to talk to, right, that we're going out to share with. So we can't just say, you know, this is why. You can't just walk out and start doing whatever you think is cool out in the middle of a group of people if you've never taken the time to listen to them. You need to get a sense for who are the people that are out there. I know the church has moved away from being neighborhood congregations anymore. Anymore, we're so defined by the larger regions that we're in, or we're defined by the internet and the ways that we can reach out on Facebook Live when we're doing our sermons and the like. And all of that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it per se. But the question is, who are you going to be talking to? Who is it you're trying to reach out to when you're sharing the gospel? And if you can know those people, then you'll be able to speak to them meaningfully. You'll earn credibility with them. This is the same both in evangelism and basic leadership training. If you're going to be a good leader, you need to earn the credibility of the people that you're with. You're given authority from above, you're given credibility from below. And you need to go out and listen to the people in order to learn credibility. The best thing you can do as an evangelist isn't to go out and once you've got all that you want to say figured out ahead of time, is go out and start talking. The best thing you can do is go out and start listening. Simple example of this, there was a church that was, or a pastor that was planning a new church in New York, 
And what he did is he went out to a local coffee house and he did a little experiment. The first day he took a little tent, you know, a little paper tent, put it up and he wrote on it, um, if you listen to my story, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. He sat down at a table, sat there, put the tent up. All day long he sat by himself. <laughs> Nobody came. No one wanted the free cup of coffee to listen to what he had to say. The second day he came back and he changed it. It said, if you buy me a cup of coffee, I'll listen to your story. He had a line that wrapped around the store. The best thing you can do to become contextually aware is to listen. People are far more willing to listen to you once they know you've listened to them. Has your church, has your congregation taken time to listen? Believe it or not, that's evangelism too. Notice that although we don't have every word Jesus ever said, he doesn't say a whole lot, right? I mean, the Gospels aren't very long. It suggests that he spent a lot of time listening to the folks around him. He spent 30 years before he even went out and preached his first sermon. He listened. He was with the people. He learned them. He respected them. And he earned credibility because of it. We need to do the same thing. We need to become meaningful and relevant to the folks we're talking to. Finally, when we take those three things together and add them, what we've got is a creative practice of evangelism. And the reason I add creative here is that, again, I want to break out of those stereotypes. It's not just about, are we going to put up the tent, and are we going to lay down the sawdust, and are we going to get George Beverly Shea to sing Just As I Am about 14 times as we wait for somebody to come walking down, right? Now, if in your, congreg in your congregation, if in your community that's meaningful, then great, go for it. There's nothing wrong with it. But what I want to get across is this. Once you know what's so good about Jesus that you're excited about it, once you have the words to talk about it from your theological reflection, and once you understand what's meaningful to the people around you, you're free to share that gospel in a way that's meaningful to the people, however seems best. You can be creative about it. It doesn't have to be about preaching a revival. It doesn't have to be about passing out tracts. It could be in any kind of different way that you can think of. Evangelism is anything that you do to share the good news and invite others to come follow Jesus Christ. It's anything you do. There's no one practice or technique that defines evangelism. So be creative about it. Be open to it. Consider what are the different ways you can do this. Have a comedy night at your church. Don't do anything in the church. Go out and just hang out in the, uh, if, if you've got parades or if there's a 4th of July event, just tell all your folks, look, we're not going to do a church thing, but what we're going to do is get together at the church. We're going to pray about whoever God's going to take us to go talk to, and then you all go out and be the, be the salt of the world. Go hang out there. Set up your blanket somewhere as a family. And then if you get a chance to talk to somebody, talk to them. And we'll have prayed that whoever that you're going to talk to, you'll have an opportunity to be able to, to share about your faith. It doesn't have to be a church thing. We don't have to be defined by congregational walls and, and, uh, and, and ministries and rubrics in doing this. Right? Jesus wasn't. Right? Jesus had barely trained the disciples. And then he says, okay, you all go out two by two and go raise the dead or something, you know, right? And tell them I'm on my way, you know? So go do that. Go raise the dead. Go heal the sick. Go out and do things out in the larger community. That's evangelism. Be creative about it. And when I say raise the dead, I'm not kidding about this. I'm not saying you may raise someone whose body, but what's dead in your community? Where are the dead places in your community? Where are the places that people feel as though they've been dead to the, those who are around them? to the situations that have died because no one's paid attention there and there are people lost in them. Go to those places and reach out in a way that seems good. Just be authentic to who you are. Don't try to force it into something else. Now, this means you're probably going to have to change some things in your congregation, right? What do you need to change to do them? This is a basic leadership issue. You're going to have to change some stuff. You're going to have to change the way that you, maybe you allocate some resources. You may have to change the way that some committees are structured. You may have to change the way people think about evangelism in your congregation. I know change isn't fun. <laughs> I know it's hard as a pastor because people get cranky and those same people are the ones that put your salary in the plate when it gets passed around. This is also the work of the kingdom. There's no way not to make this happen. I wish I could sugarcoat that for you. I wish I could make it easier. I wish I could had some kind of technique for it. 
all I've got is, this is where relying on the Holy Spirit to work is important because we need the Holy Spirit to work inside the congregation as well as outside. Remember, we're not just calling people outside the church to become disciples, we're calling those inside the church to become more, full, more fully committed as disciples. And we're gonna to have to move through that process along with them. So recognize that, there will be change, but it's worth it in the end. I won't spend a lot of time here, I know we're almost done, but I just wanted to point out that you can use this equation with folks from the past. So I noodled around with what I think John Wesley's equation would have been, that God is with us and calls us to be part of God's abundant life. There's this whole story, right, about how John Wesley comes to know that God is with us, right, through his whole young life and how he, he, becomes, uh, he becomes secure in the idea that we can be at peace with God through all of his experiences up until his early 30s. Um, and then theology. Two main things, I think, that uh, Wesley believed, that God is holy and demands that we live in perfect love of God and neighbor. And that would be scary if it was by itself, because then we've got no way, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> we can never live up to that. But the second is this, that God is gracious and therefore forgives our sins and empowers us to be able to love others. The context in which he was set in, in uh, the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution in England, many marginal Christians who were unchurched and morally suspect, that's my nice way of saying that they got drunk and went to prostitutes a lot, um, and an economic and political and ecclesiastical system that marginalizes the poor. All of this is going on in England at the time. So what does he do? He comes up with the class and band and societies right? Multiple entry points to reach and disciple people at different levels of faith. Class, if you're just getting involved, society, once you've become a member, and a band when you want to go really deep in your faith. Wherever you are, you've got a way to plug into and grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ in Methodism. He had oversight. He develops the whole conference system that we're living out today, right, to make sure that there's oversight into how the ministry is run, and finally, he engages with the social structures of his day. He gets involved with passing out medicine to those who are in need. He gets involved with caring for prisoners. He gets involved with dealing with the poor. He goes out and engages with them directly. Notice what Wesley's doing here, I don't have. I mean, he did his field preaching too, but it's just one of many, right? All of these different things are evangelistic. They're all different ways of sharing the gospel and drawing people back in, all different ways of presenting the goodness of God to those around him and in drawing people back into discipleship. That's my point about being creative. You can do things beyond what we traditionally think of as evangelistic because there are so many ways to share the goodness of God and invite people into it. Two more slides. What might attract folks when you're thinking about being creative? This comes from the same Lifeway research in 2016. What's interesting here is that uh, they looked at all these different ways that people might be more or less likely to come if they were invited to the church. And notice, I know it's really tiny, I'll read it for you. The top one was what gets most people interested, uh, where people said that they are likely or extremely likely to attend, and you've got 62% of the people saying that, is an event to help make your neighborhood safer. The next is a community service project, and you've got 51% of the people saying that they would be likely or extremely likely to attend. 34% say they'd be likely or extremely likely to attend a worship service. 26% to a small group where people could talk about God. Now, here's the thing. This is a big national survey. Your local region, your local neighborhood might not be the same as this. Each neighborhood, right? This is contextual awareness. The point of bringing this up is to Dwight L. Moody's point, I like my way of evangelism of your way of not doing it, right? <laughs> um, the whole idea is that how you do evangelism is going to be up to what fits best with your context. What we're learning here in this big survey is that you've got at least a third chance of somebody coming if you invite them to come to a worship service. You've got a better than half a chance if you're inviting them to come to a community service project or to something about improving the safety of the neighborhood it doesn't really matter what you're inviting them to. That's what I wanna get across. It could be the worship service, it could be something else. It could be something that doesn't show up on your dashboard. All right, hear me on that. So often we define whether evangelism has been successful based on whether the metrics say it's successful or not, and the metrics get handed down from Nashville. 
Now, I, I adore Heather Lear, who works in Nashville, so this isn't bashing the people who are there, but the system that we've set up doesn't always measure the things that are helpful to show whether you're being effective in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and inviting them to become disciples. So the question is, how can you be effective in doing that? And if it doesn't show up on the dashboard, that's okay. It shows up on God's dashboard. <laughs> God may see things that Nashville doesn't, and that's all right, <laughs> okay? So don't worry about whether it's something that the metrics say are right. Worry about whether there are transformed lives coming out of it. Choose whatever needs to be chosen in order to make that happen. All right, one little technique. I promise it's the only one because I'm not a big fan of techniques. Who do you invite? What you do, if you're, gonna be, if you're inviting people to anything, whatever it is, these are the folks that are most likely to come. Here's the sweet spot for who to invite. You have trust and you have need. People who fall into both of those, people who trust you and people who have a need right now are the most likely to respond in a positive way when you're reaching out with evangelism. They trust you because they know you care about them already. So these are people you're probably already in a relationship with. Um, and they've seen you enact your faith. They know that you're legitimate about it. So you've been doing the word, but you've also been doing the deed. They see that there's something legitimate in what you're offering. If they trust you already, they will be more likely to hear what you have to say. And if they're in a place of need, if they're looking for answers in their life right now, if they're in a transition, in a crisis, or if they're marginalized by a larger group somehow, they are more open to hearing what you say. Now, please, please understand this. I am not talking about preying on people who are in difficult circumstances. I'm don't, we don't want to manipulate people who are in need. What I am suggesting is that there are times in people's lives when they are asking the question, why? And they're coming up without a good answer. And we have an opportunity as an act of love then to say, hey, here's how I've made sense of the answer why, or the, how to answer the question why. Here's how I'm making sense of it. Let me just share that with you. Not to try to manipulate you, not to try to force you to believe what I believe, but just to tell you how I've made sense of my life and the good that I've known through answering the question why because of Jesus Christ. These are the people that are most open to hearing it. The other thing to bear in mind with this is that because there's trust involved, you're not talking about going out to strangers and doing this, right? So often when we think about evangelism, it's standing on street corners. And I've done that when I was in youth group, we had to do it. They would bus all of us down to Washington, D.C. So all of us you know, there are a lot of white kids that lived in my area. They'd bus us down into Washington, D.C., where there aren't so many white kids, and they would have us stand on the street corners with our little gospel tracts and hand them out to strangers, right? And there was this complete inability of people to understand each other, and it just looked wrong on so many levels, right? We never went down and learned them. We didn't build a relationship with them, and that's the way we so often think of evangelism. It's go out and find a stranger and club him with the Bible for Jesus, right? That's the way we often think about it. And yet evangelism is done best when there's a relationship that we've built with somebody, when they've learned to trust us because they've seen us live out our lives. By the way, that means that we have to be living out our faith on a regular basis. Evangelism isn't just a show we put on when we're trying to get them to say yes to Jesus. It's the way we live every day because they see us every day. They see us in our struggles. They see us when we have our questions and we go through our dark times as well. And that's all right. They just see in the midst of it that we do our best to hold on to our faith. We don't have to be saints. We don't have to be remarkable. We just have to be honest people working our best to be faithful as best we can. If we know people like that, especially in times of need, they'll be more willing to hear us when we say, let me share how I've made sense of my life and how I've tried to answer the question why. I know that's a lot to absorb in an hour, and I know that we've got one minute, according to my watch at least, until you get a break, and you desperately need a break because you probably got to vote on something and be smart about it. Um, and so I want to make sure you have time to do that. But I do want to let you know this isn't the end of the conversation. Um, Heather Lear and I, one of the things that we wanted to do is to provide a way to break down the walls between the local church, Nashville, and the seminary. It's so often, I know those of us in the seminary seem like we live in our little ivory tower and kind of look down condescendingly at everyone else. 
Um, and Nashville just seems like an unassailable fortress that never answers its phone. And, uh, and uh, you know, then there's the local church, right? Those of you who are actually doing God's work. And so one of the things we want to do is break that down. And so what we've done is uh, beginning this October, uh, October 19th through November 16th, every Thursday evening, there are five Thursdays, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., we are offering free webinars. They're already paid by your, uh, your world service dollars, so thank you for paying your apportionments. Um, but they're already paid for by that. Heather and I will live team teach a series of webinars, and they're open to anybody. What we'd like to do is invite you to come and sit in on the webinars. You don't have to be in a group. You can just join. You'll be put in small groups, have a chance to talk to other folks. And then if you have a weekly get-together in your congregation, Sunday morning, uh, maybe a Sunday school, or whether you have a Wednesday evening get-together, if you have multiple people who are doing and participating in these webinars, get together and talk it out with each other. And one of the really cool things we've set up is our evangelism hotline. Um, it's a voicemail, so you don't have to talk to a real person. We didn't want to spook anybody. Um, but you you can call it and tell us what you're thinking about as you're working through the webinar, and either Heather or I will personally get in touch with you to follow up and give you feedback and a sense of how things are going. So we want to invite you to participate in this. So go ahead and take this down. Again, it's free. Um, my website there, markteasdale.net, is the website that's got the portal through it. You can click on the tab that says Evangelism Online, and then when registration opens up, there'll be a button to be able to click to register for it. That probably won't happen until uh, later in the summer, but that's where it is. So I want to invite you to do that to continue the conversation and also so you don't have to go and talk about evangelism by yourselves in your congregations, um, but you'll have the backup of both a seminary professor and the director of evangelism for the denomination supporting you when you do that. Um, so we invite you to come do it. We can uh, house up to 200 people to be a part of these. Um, I will have some of my seminary students who are participating, but we'd be glad to have you come in so you can tell them what real life is like, and they can see that as well. That's everything that I've got for you today. Um, we're right after, so thank you so much for sharing your lunch with me. I appreciate it, and I'll be hanging around at the Garrett table if you've got questions. <laughs>